Bro, wake up, it's 2013. That's right, the Oculus Rift DK1 has just launched after a successful Kickstarter campaign, and it can be yours right now for just $300. No, no, wait a minute, it's actually 2022, and Oculus, well, Meta, is here to offer you a much newer, much fancier headset for that $300. Hey, I'm Rory, and this is VR Compare. Today we'll be seeing how the Oculus Rift DK1 stacks up against its much newer counterpart, the Quest 2. The Quest 2 has been out for over a year already, but that's nothing compared to how long this guy has been kicking around. Releasing in 2013, the Oculus Rift DK1 has a whole nine years under its belt, earning itself a well-deserved position as the genesis of modern VR. I'm here to ask, how long have we actually come in the eight years between this thing and this thing? Firstly, let's see what you get when you buy each headset. The unboxing experience for the Rift DK1 is undeniably awesome. This hard plastic case is genuinely one of the coolest boxes for a piece of tech that I've ever seen. Cracking it open feels like opening up a case of classified technology. Definitely a fantastic piece of design. There's a fair few things going on inside here. We've got the headset itself with a flexible fabric strap and a hardwired video cable. A connection box complete with four ports, including a barrel connector for power, a USB mini B port for data, and a choice of either HDMI or DVI for video. Yep, that means you need three different cables to make this thing work. Other than that, we have the cables themselves, a male to female DVI to HDMI adapter, and three different sets of lenses to choose from, each offering a different level of myopia adjustment. That's actually pretty cool. There's something really important that's completely missing from this kit though. Let's move over to the Quest 2 and you'll see what I mean. Unboxing the Quest 2 is also a really nice experience. Honestly, I don't think you can really beat the feeling of cracking open that DK1 case, but regardless, it's a really sleek piece of packaging, and it does get you excited to see what's inside when you slide off that sleeve and open up the hinged lid. The Quest 2 unboxing experience is much simpler. You get the headset, a box with all your extras, a manual, a USB-C to C cable, and a power adapter, and now we see the first major difference between the devices, controllers. This is a huge deal. The Rift DK1 doesn't come with controllers of any kind. Back when this thing released, you were expected to sit in front of your PC with an Xbox controller or even just a mouse and keyboard. The Quest 2 ships with two of Oculus's third generation touch controllers, which have been iterated on since the launch of the Rift CV1 back in 2016. Anyone who has used a modern VR headset knows how essential controllers are to the experience. Another thing you'll notice about the Quest 2 is the lack of video cables. Well, technically the tiny charging cable works for a video connection, but geez. The Quest 1 came with a way longer cable, so what's up with this? Anyway, this thing doesn't even need a video cable. Its XR2 chipset makes it a fully capable standalone device, something that was a distant dream back in 2013. So yeah, the Quest 2 is already displaying some clear advantages over its grandpa, but we haven't even turned either device on yet. Let's try setting them up. Setting up the Quest 2 is quite easy, but it definitely has its issues. In order to get started, you need the headset itself, and then a smartphone with the Oculus app and a Facebook account to log in with. Once you've got that, you can basically just pair your headset to the app and you're good to go. The Facebook account requirement is quite controversial. It forces people who only wanted to use Oculus products into the Facebook ecosystem, regardless of if they actually want to use Facebook's other products or not. It's also really bad for businesses because of the fact that you can't set up a business account on the device. Facebook actually released a statement on this where they said that they were considering changing this in the future, but this statement was very much geared towards specifically businesses. So for the foreseeable future, consumers are probably going to have to keep using their Facebook accounts. Not only that, but some people who've made Facebook accounts specifically to use the Quest 2 have actually been banned, leaving themselves with a $300 brick that they have to resell. That's not great. All that aside, the Quest 2 setup experience is still very easy. Once you've paired it to the app, you just turn on the device and you're pretty much already good to go. Setting up the DK1 on the other hand is a different ballgame entirely. You need to plug it into your machine using the USB cable and one of the video connections, and don't forget about the power connection as well. Once it's all connected, press the power button and a little LED will come on in the middle of the Oculus logo. I won't lie, that's pretty awesome. 
So now that it's plugged in, let's check the PC. And nothing. Okay, so we need to find old drivers, right? Turns out there's a link on the Oculus developer portal where you can still find the latest version of the legacy runtime. Cool, so we install that, and still nothing. Right, no problem. We just need to open the config utility and set the headset up from there, right? No dice. At this point, you'll start to realize how non-existent the support for the DK1 is in Windows 10. If you want to make this thing work in 2022, you're going to have to go through a complicated and failure-prone process with the following steps. Step 1. Find a legacy version of the Oculus runtime that isn't distributed anywhere by an official or verifiable source. Step 2. Install the legacy runtime, but don't let it install the display driver, because apparently that can stop the headset from working at all, and even for one user made his PC get stuck in a boot loop. Step 3. Set all of your executables to run in Windows 8 compatibility mode and to run as an administrator. And then when you launch the tool, you have to make an offering to the VR gods and hope against all odds that the device has magically appeared. After a lot of messing around, I managed to get my DK1 to appear in the legacy environment, but no matter how hard I tried, I could not get the thing working with Steam VR. Hey, at least I can hang out in this pretty demo world. Yeah, um, getting this thing to work nowadays is a pretty terrible experience. I honestly wouldn't recommend it to anyone unless you really, really want to see how it is. At this point, the DK1 is more of a museum piece than a functional headset. If you really want a budget VR headset, just pick up a used Rift CV1 or maybe an old Vive kit or even a used Windows Mixed Reality kit for $100 or so. This thing is not viable anymore. With that aside, let's take a look at the specifications of each device and how they compare. What makes a comparison between the Quest 2 and the Rift DK1 so interesting is the fact that these were both the same price. This is what $300 would get you in 2013, and this is what $300 would get you in 2021. With inflation, the DK1 would have cost something more in the range of $350 today, but that's still very close to the price you can pick up a Quest 2 for. In fact, higher storage models of the Quest 2 are being sold right now for $400. That being said, it's really, really important to note that Meta is almost certainly selling these things at a loss to get people through the door. The Quest 2's $300 price tag is actually $100 less than they sold the original Quest for. In comparison, the Lynx R1 and the Pico Neo 3 Pro, other XR2-based standalones, are currently being sold for $600 and $700 respectively. It would be safe to assume that Meta is also producing the Quest 2 for somewhere around this price. All that aside, let's take a closer look at these devices, starting with the optics. The Rift DK1 comes with a set of three aspherical lenses to choose between, two of which are designed to correct the image for glasses wearers. The Quest 2, on the other hand, has a pair of integrated Fresnel lenses that can't be removed from the device. However, while the DK1 has three choices of lenses, the IPD cannot be adjusted. The lenses on the DK1 are fixed at 63.5mm, while the Quest 2's lenses can be snapped between three different settings to accommodate for users with an IPD ranging between 58 and 68mm. This still isn't perfect. An integrated hardware IPD slider would have been ideal to get the lens separation just right, but it's a lot better than the fixed setting of the DK1. The Rift DK1 has a single 1280 by 800 LCD panel delivering a per eye resolution of 640 by 800. The Quest 2 blows this out of the water, with a massive jump to 1832 by 1920 per eye, also delivered by an LCD panel. This is almost a three times increase in horizontal resolution. Not only that, but these panels run at 120Hz, which is twice the refresh rate that you get with the DK1. Admittedly, a lot of standalone content on the Quest 2 will run at 90Hz, but come on, the DK1 doesn't even know what standalone content is. Taking a look at the field of view of each device is a bit less surprising. The DK1 offers a manageable FOV of around 90 degrees, both horizontal and vertical, whereas the Quest 2's horizontal FOV ranges between 85 degrees and 97 degrees, depending on the wearer's IPD. My IPD is particularly wide at 69mm, so I'm a lot closer to the 85 degree end of the spectrum, which is a bit of a shame. Don't expect either of these headsets to blow you away with their fields of view. We can compare the pixel density of the two devices, but this is a bit more complex. In order to properly calculate angular pixel density, also known as pixels per degree, for a device, we need to find out the FOV it renders at. We also need to know the binocular overlap, which is the number of degrees of the FOV that can be seen by both eyes when looking through the headset. The Quest 2 renders at 104 degrees horizontal, with a binocular overlap of 90 degrees. Punching these numbers in gives you an angular pixel density of 18.88 pixels per degree. Something very important to note here is that this is an average across the display. Generally, lenses will cause some areas of the screen to be warped, giving a higher PPD on some portions of the visible field of view. 
Getting accurate pixel density information for the DK1 is a lot harder, and finding rendered FOV measurements online for the headset is also pretty difficult. If we make a few assumptions about the headset, we can still make a reasonable estimate. For this comparison, I'm going to assume that the DK1 renders at the same FOV that is visible to the user, so at 90 by 90 degrees. Now we have to estimate the binocular overlap. The binocular overlap of the Quest 2 is around 86% of its horizontal FOV. Applying that ratio to the Rift DK1 would give us a binocular overlap of 77 degrees. Based on these estimations, that would put the Rift DK1 at an angular pixel density of 7.66 pixels per degree. That's less than half of the Quest 2. Even if the DK1's overlap was significantly lower at 50 degrees, which it almost certainly isn't, that would only bump the PPD up to 9.14, still less than half of the Quest 2's crisp display and optics. Moving on to tracking, the Quest 2 is equipped with state-of-the-art camera-based inside-out tracking, with four integrated cameras that track the position and rotation of the headset and controllers, giving the wearer a full 6 degrees of freedom without needing base stations. The Rift DK1 doesn't need base stations either, awesome! Except when you realise that's because it just flat out lacks positional tracking. Yep, it's a 3 DOF rotationally tracked headset. Hope you guys enjoy seated experience because that's all you're getting. No room scale for this guy. It doesn't end there either. These 6 DOF tracked controllers that come with the Quest 2, you don't even need them. The tracking cameras can also be used to control the headset entirely through hand tracking, and it works surprisingly well. The DK1 doesn't even have a camera for pass-through, let alone any kind of tracking. Oh, and did I mention? The Quest 2 has integrated pass-through that you can enable at any time by tapping the side of the headset. Pretty neat, huh? At this point, the Quest 2 is really starting to look like a colossal jump from the DK1, and it's still got a lot of tricks up its sleeve. You can even connect the headset to your PC via USB to play PC-powered content as well, although this will require some compression of the video signal. Or if you don't want any cables at all, you can use AirLink or Virtual Desktop to play PC VR content wirelessly, as long as you have a decent router. AC1200 or better should do the trick. The Quest 2 also has an integrated audio solution complete with stereo speakers, an integrated microphone, and a 3.5mm audio jack. The Rift DK1 has, well, none of that. You'll need to bring your own headphones and microphone, and that likely means you'll need even more cables going from your head to your PC. By now you're probably getting the point. The Quest 2 is leaps ahead of the DK1 in visual quality, tracking, the ability to use controllers, and even the ability to use your hands with it. And don't forget, it runs standalone content as well. Honestly, looking back at the DK1 has been really refreshing for me. It's got a sleek design, amazing packaging, a lot of extras like the detachable lenses, and honestly, it just feels like a nice enthusiast product. I do not regret picking up one of these. If you want a nice VR collector's item, this is the thing to go for. You can find used models of these for sometimes less than $50, including the case and accessories. It's really not expensive, and it's an awesome collector's piece. To me, that's an absolute steal, considering that this is essentially the birth of modern VR. Just don't buy this thing expecting a usable product or you will be ripping your hair out. So what have we learned here? Well, actually, VR has moved quite far in eight years. We've gone from something that is cumbersome and hard to set up to something that's extremely easy to use and doesn't even need a PC to play games with. Quite frankly, this thing blows the DK1 out of the water. You have to remember as well, we've come this far in eight years, so how far can we come in another eight years? Personally, I can't wait to see what VR is going to bring in the next decade. And yeah, I know there's a lot more than just Oculus slash Meta products. Don't worry, I'm not a shell, I swear. Keep an eye out for a future video. I'll be covering something a bit more interesting. Hey, thanks for watching the pilot episode of the VR Compare YouTube channel. If you're just as stoked about this as I am, then let me know. Like the video, leave a comment, or subscribe. And if you'd like to know more about the DK1 or the Quest 2, you can check out my spec sheets on the VR Compare website. Links in the description. For those who don't know, VR Compare is also a website. You can view spec sheets for all VR and AR devices, and you can make comparisons between them. Check it out. One last thing. If you want to know whenever a new VR or AR headset is announced, you can follow at VRCompare on Twitter or go to Reddit and look at our VRCompare subreddit, r slash VRCompare. Cheers.